Well, for those who may, who may have missed it, I wanted to thank you all because you did a great job with the kids. You know, I add my thanks to the one that was just given. You, you really were magnificent. And I could tell everybody's having a lot of fun. All right, so this is my fun because I am somebody who was uh, very involved with persistence in biodegradation throughout graduate school. This is an area that's always interested me. So right now we're going to talk about persistence. We're going to talk about degradation, biodegradation. And what we're focusing on here, remember that risk equation? Risk is a function of hazard and exposure. Earlier we talked about how do we design out hazard. Now we're going to talk about how do we design out exposure. So making the molecule goes away, the molecule goes away, we don't have exposure, and we decrease the potential for risk. All right, so this is what we're going to talk about in green chemistry principle number 10. So chemical products should be designed so that at the end of their function they break down simpler structures, hopefully all the way to CO2 and, and elements, to innocuous degradation products and do not persist in the environment so that they do not cause exposure to target organisms and thereby cause toxicity. All right, so these are the learning objectives. Fairly straightforward. Let's talk about persistence. So chemical persistence actually is defined in regulatory contexts in a number of uh, PBT conventions. And US and European Union have these PBT conventions. Persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic. And to be a PBT, those three are anded together, not or together. So you have to be P, you have to be B, you have to be T, and you're designated PBT. And for an industry that's making a chemical, that's not a place they want to be. You end up on all kinds of bad lists. It's not, not the kind of prominence anybody wants. The left-hand column defines not persistence. And some of the criteria, as I mentioned, in different jurisdictions are, are a little different. So these are not universally applicable. The yellow is a designation for P. And the red, you move on, and that is the, the um, the V, so very persistent. And um, you see about six month half life, two month half life for the, um, the persistence, which actually is not terribly hard to do for a molecule. It's nice if a molecule will be readily degraded, removed in a short period of time, but a lot of times molecules just are not removed at that quick a rate. So you know, sometimes it takes a couple of months depending on the environment it ends up in. Here's a half-lives of selected pesticides. You see it varies all the way from 2,4-D, which is a great molecule. It's effective, removed rapidly, one of the reasons it's used so much, uh, compared to DDT, which we've already talked about a lot today. Hangs around for a while. Degradation, breakdown of substances to simpler molecules. Biological breakdown is carried out by a number of organisms. It's primarily the bacteria and the, the fungi that are involved in that. Uh, physical chemical breakdown, hydrolysis, photolysis, uh, both of those are properties somebody can design for. So creating molecules that have the ability to fall apart because of hydrolysis or photolysis catalyzed mechanisms. Uh, persistence happens, it creates problems, uh, and there's different ways it can occur. So the rate of emission can exceed the rate of degradation may take a long time for a compound that was only used a short period of time, such as DDT in this part of the world, uh, to fall back to background levels. And persistent prob, uh, substances, one of the problems is that they may be transported for long distances. And uh, you hear and read about uh, Arctic animals, for example, having uh, high levels, or not high level, they have detectable levels of um, various uh, persistent compounds. All right, I think we've already beat DDT quite a bit today, so I'm going to skip over these. Uh, you get this compound. Uh, some of these may surprise you. So this first example here, the, the US Centers for Disease Control took a look at uh, 212 chemicals in Americans. That's you and I and the other folks you see walking around on the street out there today. And looked at chemicals and their metabolites and found most of them in the blood, serum, and urine samples from about 2,500 individuals. Everybody okay with that? Well, you know, I'm a very much a risk-based person when it comes to evaluating whether a chemical's a problem or not. But I have to say, if somebody said, 
were you okay with your kids having this burden of chemicals? And eh, you know, you get a little squeamish about that. I prefer that that wasn't the case. Uh, in response to this, the CDC, American, uh, CDC report, the American Chemistry Council stressed that the levels are low, which in fact they were, and more research is needed to determine if there's a health concern. What does that, co what's that code for when more research is needed to determine if there's a health concern? It's code for we don't know. Um, so again, uh, more research is needed. Uh, the full list of chemicals is available at this website. Uh, another uh, group of emerging compounds, and one I, I worked on this issue a lot when I was part of Pfizer, is pharmaceuticals in the environment as a function of excretion of unmetabolized uh, compounds that then end up going through wastewater treatment plants uh, into uh, surface waters. So tests have detected minute concentration of pharmaceuticals in the drinking water supplies. They have been detected in some drinking waters, but this is, we're talking about drinking water supplies, so surface water from which uh, water is removed to produce drinking water, of 48 million people in two dozen major me American metropolitan areas. Um, so, you know, this again catches people's um, attention and, um, you know, this was linked together at a time when um, uh, the feminization of fish was de being detected and in particular around the Potomac when that was reported, EPA and FDA's phones lit up quite a bit. Um, and, and another thing, when people uh, heard about pharmaceuticals, you know, all that language at the end of the pharmaceutical direct-to-consumer um, advertising about, you know, risks, tar off-target effects and things, well, when you take a pharmaceutical, it's, it's, there's a ring-fenced population, as I mentioned, that takes that pharmaceutical. Environmental exposure, you know, that fence falls apart, and it's just everybody. So that's the difference between EPA's handling of compounds and FDA's. FDA can create, this is the patient population. When they were out there in the environment, it was a very different situation. Another example is PFAS. And this is how it's used. It is soil stain resistant treatments, uh, coatings, metal surfaces. You know, we all have, you know, those metal uh, pans that are, are nonstick, and they're great, but, um, you know, they also have PFAS or, or perfluorochemicals in them. I'll scratch that. Now, PFAS has been detected in the blood of tissues, wide range of animals, wide range of locations. Uh, marine debris, we talked a little bit about this. And prior to a few weeks ago, I used to think of marine de debris primarily in plastic in general, primarily as a, as a visible uh, nuisance rather than as a, a toxicity issue. But I read a paper recently that described, as I mentioned earlier, about these being a sink for compounds that are out in the environment. So I have, to, I have to rethink my way through this a little bit, but certainly lots of marine debris out there. Um, so what don't we want in chemicals? And these are persistent organic pollutants, and, and there are a number of other, there are a number of PLP or POPs conventions out there where these compounds are, are designated and banned, so this is not a, a good list to be on either. And one of the things you notice about these, well, a couple things. First, a lot of these are not necessarily natural structures, and there's lots of chlorine. So that's actually a causative issue here. The chlorine, very electron withdrawing, uh, mechanisms of aerobic enzymatic microbial biodegradation are favor electron-rich structures, so those are inherently opposing. So that's one of the reasons, or the primary reason, that pop compounds are are persistent. There are tools out there. So there's this PBT profiler uh, that's publicly available, can be used. Uh, this is a, um, a data output for benzanthracene. And you see within the circled area, this is the persistence data. So this compound, when you look across here, qualifies as a PBT compound. Okay, let's take a look at biodegradation and um, uh, talk about that a little bit. So it, it typically, from a microbe standpoint, what they're after is food. It's carbon, energy, and it's what they use as a growth substrate. So for us, they're catalysts to take compounds away. For the microbe, I'm just making a living, you know, eating whatever's in my environment. Um, it's the reduction in complexity and knowledge of biodegradation. Cycle back to that environmental risk assessment uh, uh, module I talked about earlier in the day. Biodegradation is a very key component of being able to assess the environmental exposure and impact of a chemical 
and the risk of evaluation that's done during uh, chemical product testing, for example. Uh, compounds that rapidly degrade and not likely to cause a problem. Adverse impacts can still occur if, in fact, the compounds get in the environment and there's very rapid degra degradation because that can deplete oxygen and uh, result in uh, you know, toxicity from oxygen deficiency to, uh, to fish and other organisms or if there's a significant levels of phosphorus in, in uh, nitrogen. Phosphorus is the limiting nutrient controlling growth in uh, freshwater systems. So if you add phosphorus, that typically bumps up the uh, algal level through growth. Uh, I think we've beat wastewater treatment plants to death already. There's a, a wide range of biodegradability testing out there. You can bucket it in kind of three different categories. And so this ready biodegradability category, of which there are a number of tests, and I list, listed some of them there, is done uh, early on. And if your compound passes a readily biodegradability test, you can pretty much say we're done. This compound is going to go away in most any biologically active environment. Inherent biodegradability kind of stakes out the opposite end where you can use uh, activated sludge from a wastewater treatment plant, and it will tend to let you know whether your compound has any biodegradability potential. And you can do things like uh, acclimate the sludge to your compound to try and uh, pull out organisms and, and grow them to a higher population level where they might have a capacity uh, to degrade your compound. And then there's sim simulation tests, which are much more complex and expensive where you can actually mimic an actual environment to try and determine the uh, compound's degradability. Okay, for, so for design for degradation, there are rules of thumb out there, and Bob Bothling and others who have been uh, very active in this field for a long time have helped compile these lists. So there are functional groups that, that facilitate degradation. Uh, there are other groups that hinder degradation. These are also called expert systems. Uh, the extent to which something can biodegrade is, is typically a function of how much of a natural product there is. There are some areas uh, where you have extant enzymes, so external enzymes that have been released uh, that can have broad specificity that will degrade uh, some complex organic compounds. Uh, things like uh, lignin degrading fun fungi, like uh, white rot fungi, polyporous versicolor, and some of them like that are great at degrading uh, other types of compounds because the enzyme, enzymes they release are good at oxidizing a broad range of substrates. Uh, this is kind of a cool table. It um, is a biochemical periodic table that tells you about microbial interactions with essential and non-essential chemical elements. So you go to it, each box is a link, you, ta you tap on that link and you call up a box such as the one I got down below that shows chlorine and you can read about that particular um, atom in relationship to biodegrade, biodegradation in mic microorganisms. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the University of Minnesota um, Biocatalysis and Biodegradation Database. Uh, it contains information on a lot of microbial uh, metabolic pathways, uh, reactions, a uh, number of compounds, and this provides a predictive tool for estimating biodegradability. And this is an overview of how the system works. You feed a compound in, uh, the, the system identifies functional groups. It's got certain rules uh, for functional groups and for metabolic pathways to determine the most probable uh, occurrence of biodegradation and the root of biodegradation. Take it to another compound, then you, you take that metabolite and you can plug it into the system and by that way you go through iterative loops to try and construct a biodegradation pathway. Uh, angular dioxygenation uh, illustrated here is uh, ring opening and part of the um, part of the most the most difficult parts of biodegradation typically are is the ring opening. So once you crack open a ring, a molecule typically becomes much easier to degrade. Uh, hydroxylation is is typically the the first and the key step of making the ring uh, conducive to being uh, biodegraded. This is an output from the University of Minnesota database uh, that shows the proposed uh, degradation route uh, for um, benzyl alcohol. Catabol is another system where you can estimate biodegradation. 
Uh, and, and actually, when you're using these types of systems, there, there are a few out there. It's good to use them all. You know, I'm a big believer in using all available data. So by going through different systems that are available, you have the opportunity to take advantage of uh, criteria that might be available in one system that aren't in another. Uh, this is a third system that um, was published. The authors looked at uh, MIDI data, which MIDI is a, a Japanese originated test that looks at biodegradation, readily, biodegra readily, ready biodegradability. And there's a large pool of data over there. The authors mined that data, uh, broke out a couple of structural categories, the, um, the benzene deriv monobenzene derivatives and the acyclic compounds, found groups negative that were not con that inhibited biodegradation, neutral, and then groups that favored biodegradation. And then they built that into a framework for estimating biodegradability. And when they looked at the predictability, they found uh, in, for this table two, 95% correct, correct predictions. And um, uh, for table three, 88% correct predictions. This, this, this isn't really a surprise, though, because remember we talked about QSARs? We talked about a little bit about training sets. So you use a training set to construct a QSAR. Well, this is kind of testing within a training set. So this is great. It's, it's, it's useful, but in the same way that uh, for uh, effect, where you're looking for something that can predict across a broad group of uh, chemical categories, it would be nice to have something that can do that uh, in the area of biodegradability as well. So the key learning points here are persistence dramatically increases the potential for dispersion of and exposure to chemicals, thereby increasing risk. Biological, physical, and chemical degradation me mechanisms uh, in both types can be taken advantage of in molecular design. And I think I mentioned earlier that uh, consumer product companies in particular take advantage of design for wastewater treatment plant degradation. Uh, bio is the most prevalent, and uh, there are certainly predictive tools that designers can utilize, and we can certainly do better. Uh, but you know, there's some good tools out there right now that, that can help chemical designers. So with that, I'd like to, to thank you all. My time up here is done, so I really enjoyed the day. And Hope you enjoy the, the today and, and the rest of the conference. Thank you.